Uh, hi, I'm Professor Romri Ben Shahar. I am delighted to give this first Chicago Best Ideas talk in its uh, COVID-19 format, in which rather than we're talking about our own, kind of parading our own research, we talk about the research of others on the faculty, especially something that we think is particularly uh, important, interesting, inspiring. And, and so I had no difficulty volunteering to talk about the work of my colleague, Lisa Bernstein. The work who inspired me, a particular piece of work that inspired me to be a contract scholar. I think Lisa knows that uh, how much I uh, admire that work um, and she's here with us. Um, so, and I hope I'm not going to distort too much my account of it, but this was really a formative work for me. I was a young professor and, and it gave me, inspired me to do my own work and to uh, become interested in contract law. Uh, I will plan to talk for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, describing the work, Lisa's work and that, that particular work and what it led me to think about. And uh, then if we have time, we can open it for discussion comments. If during the conversation, I have your participants list right here in front of me, so you can raise a hand if you want. I will try to not pay too much attention to the chat uh, uh, functionality at this point so that I can focus on my own, uh, on my own words. And again, I'm saying that if you want to turn on the video, you're more than welcome. There are a lot of people here who are uh, probably having lunch or doing other things, but listening with the second, uh, you know, on the side, but you don't have to, but please feel welcome. Okay, so this is what uh, the problem that Lisa's work sought to address. Everybody, you know, the, the, the most, the basic question in contract law is what are the terms of the contract? Of course, there is a contract to look at and to answer that question, but it doesn't give a complete account of all possible scenarios. For example, many contracts nowadays in every possible contract nowadays has to be interpreted in light of the COVID-19 circumstance that was not anticipated when written. Are people allowed to walk away from contracts? Is there risk allocation that is implicit in the language of the contract? We turn to interpretation. And it would not be an exaggeration to say that almost all of contract law disputes that arrive in courts or arbitration involve interpretation of the contract. It's not about shrink wrap. It's not about this or that. It's about uh, what does the contract say? Now, as we said, the explicit terms are usually incomplete. We need gap fillers. Where do these come from? Well, primarily from the law. The law says that, you know, if the parties did not agree on who bears the risk of loss during shipping, let's look at UCC and find that thing. Or if the parties did not agree as to what exactly the landlord is uh, uh, required to give the tenant in terms of uh, what, you know, quality of the utilities and so forth, we can look to municipal laws or local laws to figure that out. The law provides gap fillers. But these gap fillers are one size fits all. They are the same for all contracts. So maybe we can do better. Given that parties vary, we can do better. And I'm not trying, this is not a preview to my forthcoming book on personalized law, but rather, uh, the idea of finding gap fillers that fit these parties and to look at the context in which they have been working until now. The idea is, is uh, now widespread in law, and that is to look at the norms that govern the business norms surrounding the contract. And the first, there might be some practices in the market. You know, when a builder tells the subcontractor, I need so many two by fours, they refer to two by fours as understood in the trade. Not exactly two inches by four inches, it turns out that they are one and a half by three and a half. But there is an understanding in the field of what people mean when they say, use the language. Uh, this is a type of norm. Uh, there are also norms that arise from the relationship of the parties. They have been, they know each other, they've been dealing with each other, and as you look at their past practices, you can learn a lot as to what they intended to do uh, when they wrote the contract. 
the case for the argument in favor of using these business norms, these imminent business norms to interpret a contract is almost, uh, you know, is slam dunk. Nobody ever disputed it until Lisa. But this idea has been so attractive and has been uh, incorporated into American law, followed by the rest of the world, uh, in a way that it seems to be, it is not an exaggeration to say that the, uh, the case for it was unanimous. It originates, it is also very much in, uh, consistent with the logic, the philosophy of legal realism. Legal realism tells us, let's dump old 19th century British formalism of law, you know, that things have to do ex exactly this way and we're constricted and we look through narrows to figure out what things, let's broaden our look and see, look at the world around us and that have that reflect in the law. What better opportunity to implement this philosophy than in commercial context where you have commercial realities. People in the, you know, businesses and people interact all the time. That creates a reality. This reality should reflect, should be reflected in the obligations of the parties. We should look at the reality of markets, of sectors, of localities, of these parties. Zoom in on these two parties and look at their 20 year relationship to understand what their reality is and reflect that in the contract. So, you know, th this has been uh, this idea, which was the, which is basically the definition of legal realism, has been implemented into the Uniform Commercial Code the chief drafter of Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code, Carl Llewellyn, who, if this was my contract class, I would tell you, look outside the class, turn left, and see his picture there on the wall, a professor at the university a long time ago, and a very important legal philosopher and commercial law scholar, led, you know, it is not that common that you take a philosopher to write a commercial law, but that's what we had, and they brought uh, Carl Llewellyn, he's wasn't a kind of a highfalutin ivory tower philosopher. He believed in commercial practices, in empirical validation. And he wrote a law, a law that instructs courts to interpret contracts based on the commercial reality of the parties. The Uniform Commercial Code says that the course of actual performance between the parties is the best indication what they intended. Section 222 of the code. It, when the Uniform Commercial Code defines the agreement, namely that thing that is enforceable, it defines it not just as the contract, the four corners of the contract, but it is the bargain between the parties in fact, not the bargain between the parties on paper, on text. It is the context, in fact, as found in their language or by implication from other circumstances, including the course of performance, course of dealings and other. So that is the idea that is in the background. Chuck, throw away formalism, bring on, bring, oh, bring into the law legal realism, and throw away rigidity, inaccuracy, technocracy, ancient law, unfair law, bring in all these wonderful new ideas that have to do with flexibility. Well, then in 1996, Lisa Bernstein published an article that shattered this widespread reality and has been enormously influential, cited, endlessly influenced, discussed at the time uh, almost in every workshop. What Lisa did was not sit down and write a model or you know, go you know, write a dissertation on this. She actually went to the trade, to the ground, to the markets, to the south of the United States and see how people interact, what do they do, spoke to merchants, spoke to transactors, spoke to, spoke to business people, and began to get a sense that something different is going on on the ground. The first and foremost insight that was shocking and needed explanation was that in these transactions, and especially she looked in that study at grain and feed transactions, people that treat in grain, whatever that is, feed, animal feed, um, when, they, when people write these contracts, they are part of a trade organization. And when they have disputes, they go to arbitrators and to tribunals. And the tribunals, guess what? 
they don't look at trade usages. They don't look at their past practices. They don't look at course of performance and course of dealings. They do everything the oppos opposite than what the UCC has invented, what the code, what Carl Llewellyn, what legal realism said to us to do. They are super formalistic. What's in the writing, in the contract, and that is all. Nothing else. They don't want to hear any evidence about anything else. They, it's not that people on the ground are rigid. They're very flexible. When someone can't, can't deliver on time, they forgive. When someone is in hardship, they give l l l later um, allowance to pay less or to pay delayed. There is a lot of flexibility on the ground, but not in the law, not in the tribunals. How to reconcile that with our, you know, kind of slam dunk case for course of performance, for a uh, legal realism. So it is, Lisa made two, I think, fundamental insights. First, she says, there are, when people enter into transactions, they want to be governed by two different sets of norms. You can think of it as the law of peace and the law of war. If they are at peace, they want to be nice, pat each other on the back, give some discounts, give accommodations, meet in parties, uh, families interact, you know, have barbecues on Sundays. They can, they are engaging in a very forgiving and friendly and cooperative relationship, adopting many norms that are not written in the contract. And they're expecting to do that. You can't be mean in during times of peace or else people might shun you. They want to, you to be a peaceful player. Everything that's in the contract though is part of the law of war. If they end up being disputed, they cannot reconcile. If someone cheated, if someone stole, if someone left town and didn't, you know, took things, then you go to court or to a tribunal, and then you apply different rules, the rules that are in the contract. So that was a, a first the understanding that this is going on on the ground suggests that the code and Carl Llewellyn had a categorical conceptual mistake. They adopted the ideas of peace to be adjudicated during war. They took, they said, all these norms of cooperation and how parties transact, those should be part of litigation too. And we should resort to them when we resolve disputes. That's not what the parties want. The norms, these norms, these practices were not intended for the scenario of end game, of breakdown of the relationship. That was first insight. I love that one. But I liked even more the second insight. The second insight came from an insight when, when, when Lisa was asking these merchants, why don't you want the courts to reflect the practices of forgiveness and cooperation that you develop? Uh, they told her that if they knew that the courts are going to use their practices to create new obligations, they would not engage in those practices. If they knew that every time they say, that if they have a practice of forgiving a party in, in hardship or giving a price break or, it, or an extension in time, if they thought, if they knew that courts will then impute from that, imply from that a change in the contract such that now they are obligated to give these concessions. Hey, you gave it in the past, that showed what you intended. Now you're obligated to give it. They would stop doing this. When Bur Lisa writes, when merchants anticipate that courts will use their course of performance or course of dealings to resolve end game disputes, they will be less likely to flexibly adjust their contractual obligations. <clears throat> this really resonated to me because when I first read this, I spoke to Lisa on this, it was the mid 90s, I had little kids and I uh, remember that one of the things that I tried to implement at home as a new parent was bedtime rules. And let's say that I had with my child a 7 p.m. bedtime rule. And I noticed that when he behaves nice and asks nicely, I sometimes am willing to go and say, you know, yes, acquiesce to his request and say, you can go to sleep at 7.30 tonight, no problem. But hey, you know, if he comes to me the next day or the few day after a few of these concessions and says, hey, dad, you know, you, in the past, you allowed me to go to sleep at 7.30 or 8. So that means now I can go to sleep every night at 7.30 and or 8 then, you know, that's not what I intended. I intended this to be not part, not something I'm obligated to, 
something I'm willing to give you as a concession, if I knew that that would require now a, an erosion of the bedtime rule, I might not give these concessions. I had this same intuition coming up in my uh, practice at home that I think that Lisa was uh, uh, refl uh, reporting in the market. Merchants want flexibility. They want to be able to give concessions. But the code's instruction that courts must reflect the flexible accommodations in litigation creates not flexibility, but rigidity. It has this unintended consequences that undermines flexibility. Mr. Llewellyn, Professor Llewellyn, with this notion of let's create a law of flexible adjustments, in an unintended way created a law that harms flexibility, that forces the party to be more rigid. <clears throat> Some of you learned in first year contracts the case of Nana Culey versus Shell Oil. This is exactly that kind of scenario, if you remember. What happened there? Shell was a provider of asphalt to some uh, paver, some companies, contractors in uh, <clears throat> Hawaii. And the contract said, contract said that every time the order is made, it will be charged according to Shell's posted price at the time of delivery. Well, sometimes the price changed. There were price changes. And in those cases, Shell, in its kind of generosity or whatever other reason, was willing to forgive an increase in price and give what they called price protection. Allow the parties to pay the old price for the last delivery rather than the new price. <clears throat> the court later said, okay, you did that twice in the past. Now you're obligated to do it every time. And that ended up being very costly for Shell because that was enforced, that obligation to give a price forgiveness, price protection was enforced in the 1970s during the oil embargo when prices in the market jumped two or threefold and this Shell could not afford to give a price protection at that time. Had it known, imagine, had it known that the court would force it to now be forgiving every time, they would not have given the price protection in the first place. <clears throat> So that was the paper, the 1996 paper about course of performance. Lisa continued this, I don't know how to call it, assault on the code's legal realism approach in another kind of shocking paper where she took, looked at not the course of performance and course of dealings between these two parties, but about trade usages and customs in the market at large. You all know that, remember from first year contracts, that customs and usages are tools courts look to to interpret contracts. For example, what is chicken? What is grade A chicken? And what did Judge Friendly do when he tried to answer that question? He said, well, let's look at what the people mean in the trade. Let's look at USDA regulation. Let's look at trade associations. Let's bring experts, let's bring it to the middleman, let's, let's find information about what generally is understood by the term grade A chicken. In that case, he said he found that there's no meaning, but when we teach this case, we still say, you know, okay, in one case there was no trade usage, Every, there could be many different meanings, but generally there is a meaning. Like everybody knows that a two by four, you know, two by four lumber means one and a half by three and a half. Every baker knows that a dozen means 13. There are usages and it's just a matter of discovering them. Well, uh, Lisa, found, Lisa argues in a 1999 paper, there, aren't such, there is no such thing. Usages of trade don't exist. How does she know? Well, she went to uh, the records of many industries, the hay industry, the grain industry, the textile industry, the silk industry, and looked at their attempts during the 20th century to codify their usages. Experts met, they said and said, what is the meaning of a bale of hay? You know, you need to know what a bale of hay, what is the meaning of a carload of grain? Well, they argue, well, that's meaning this, this meaning, in the end, they each, they, they, they flew back home without an agreement. There is no common agreement. Rules committees in each industry debated for years sometimes what the customs are, failing to reach agreements, 
or conceding that they are making up rules. They are not reflecting or incorporating existing ones. Um, and that is, she saw in area after area after area. Regularities that are observed are usually very narrow. They are very, can't even call them regional, they are local. They, and these local norms vary across different localities and they do not allow us to, to create some kind of trade usage that is general um, in a larger market context. In a separate follow-up article a few years later, Lisa also looked at these cases that actually adjudicate trade usage, like Judge Friendly's What is a Chicken case, and saw that in a great majority of these cases, there's no evidence is brought. Nothing objective is brought to show the court what is the trade usage. One party, the plaintiff stands and says, well, the usage is, you have to give something. Of course, they, say, they testify for something self-serving. The other party stands up, the defendant and testifies or brings an employee to testify, well, the usage and the custom is another. Uh, very rarely in a minority of cases, there are non-party testimonies. Very few of them come from experts. Only in a handful of cases in the history of this litigation did the court admit evidence from trade codes, from codes of the trade associations. Basically, the, the argument is there is no objective custom that is adjudicated in courts. Not surprisingly, given the other paper saying that there is no objective custom out there in the trades because they can't agree what the custom is. Okay, so, in sum, when you look at uh, Professor Bernstein's work, it takes upon this fundamental idea in basically in all of law, that realism is more attractive than formalism. Formalism has such limitations, it's so inaccurate, it neglects so much evidence. Let's use, let's embrace law that brings it more evidence, the litigation, we can see what's really going on underground. Um, and uh, she, in, in the work, Professor Epps, uh, uh, Bernstein challenges the idea that such practices even exist, that they can be verified by courts, but more fundamentally, she introduces the possibility that once we do that, once we observe what the parties do and try to use it in litigation, we are going to change the way they are uh, in behaving. It's kind of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Once you look, go into the lab and observe some kind of uh, activity, you're changing that activity. Um, and that particular, that particular idea, idea, as I said initially, and I'm, as I'm moving towards completing my, uh, my lecture, I'll just mention briefly how that inspired me in my own work. It occurred to me that the phenomenon Professor Bernstein was talking about, namely parties making concessions, this kind of law of peace that they have, the cooperative norms that people adopt as they are uh, engaging in behavior, if the law tries to use it to create formal or enforceable rights, that would change their behavior. It occurred to me that that particular uh, uh, insight is much more much broader than contract law. I call this in my own work types of erosion rules. Erosion rules are rules that do the following thing. The law creates some kind of formal entitlement. Let's say you have an ownership right or a contractual right, but you can lose it if you allow some violations to go uncontested. If you allow it, things to occur, you know, flexibly, you don't enforce all sorts of violations or infringements or breaches that uh, you don't want to bother with or too maybe costly to enforce, you might lose your right. A, a very a, a, a prominent example of an erosion rule is the doctrine of adverse possession in property law, in real property law, where it says that you know, if someone in a, your a, a neighbor starts encroaching upon your property, putting a fence, a few inches or a foot into your property and you don't enforce against that, you will, after some statute limitation period, you will lose this right, you're right. The doctrine is also known very much in intellectual property law under, you know, there are doctrines of latches or estoppel uh, 
that say that, you know, if you sleep on your rights and don't enforce, and other people continue with their violation, they use your copyright or your trademark or your patent, and you don't stop them, you will be stopped later from stopping. Your, your formal legal entitlement will erode because you showed some flexibility and did not rigidly and strictly enforce against it. Statutes of limitations generally do that. You have a right, but only if you enforce it vigorously. If you don't, at some point you will lose it. Waiver, many other examples are these erosion rules, formal entitlements that are uh, diminished or forfeited or lost when the owner allows violations to go unenforced. Now, these rules have traditionally been thought of, and there's enormous commentary in each one of these areas showing that these are arguing these rules are bad for owners. If you have a right, and if you might lose it by virtue of no, your non enforcement against violations, that's not good for you. Well, applying Lisa's question, uh, I realize there is actually a counter effect. If you have a right and your neighbor encroaches upon it, you might not care. Who cares? You know, they walk through, they put some, they put their kids' little playground uh, partly into your property. You're not going to do anything about it. It's not nice, it's costly. But wait a minute. If now that means that after a period of limitation, under the doctrine of adverse possession, they can go to the land registry and change title and move the boundary into, you know, against, you know, you shrink your property, now you will have a greater incentive to enforce. Uh, the stakes have become greater because of this erosion possibility. Making the stakes have become more long term, and owners will be more motivated to spend more to fend off. And encroachers and violators will realize that they are not going to get away with it. So even though it's costly to enforce, it might pay off. The doctrine of latches in trademark law, uh, copyright law, IP says that those who slumber on their rights might be stopped from reclaiming them. Well, under that doctrine, you will not slumber on your right. So there is this effect built in, incentive effect built in. And in general, these erosion rules create two effects. One, on the one hand, there is some erosion. If you don't enforce, you lose the right. On the other hand, if you, there is this added incentive to enforce this enforcement effect that leads you to not let those violations continue. And in a paper that I wrote around that time, in the late 90s, I showed through a, some, a formal model that these two effects exactly balance out. Put differently, the choice of legal regime, whether the law allows, allows rights to erode, contractual rights to erode, property rights to erode, and so on, and if it does, at what speed do you lose your right? Is adverse possession 16 years, 10 years, or five years? Doesn't really matter. The value of the right is the same because of this in the countervailing effect of this added incentive to, to enforce. I proved this irrelevance result of erosion rules um, and uh, have long since, but it was entirely inspired by the work that uh, I read uh, Professor Bernstein to do in the context of and contract rights and how they can get modified and waived and changed through course of performance and course of dealings. Okay, so that was, I, I look to this, even though some of the work Professor Bernstein did before she came to Chicago, uh, and, um, much of it has been part, uh, one of what I regard Chicago's all time best ideas. And I was uh, particularly eager to share that with you. And if you have any comments, questions, um, discussion, this is the time. Uh, Professor Bernstein is here with us, so this is a, maybe also an opportunity. If you want, you can jump in. Uh, I'll let you, uh, you know, have the podium. Unmute yourself, you're muted. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, that was as clear a rendition of my ideas as I've ever heard. Um, I hope some of my students are watching. Um, Omri some things up very well. I just want to add one small thing, which is that even the example of the two by four is not really a custom in the sense of something people just do. If you look at the history of the two by four, what you see 
is that early, um, in the early 1900s, a two by four meant one thing in Seattle, a different thing in New York, and a third thing in Atlanta. And it also differed by type of wood. And when the lumbermen got together to try to write down the answer to the question, what's a two by four, they couldn't do it. And their disagreement was so profound that they did something that you rarely see industries do. They ran screaming to the Department of Commerce and said, we can't agree on what's a two by four. Can you just tell us please and write it in a US commercial product standard so that we all know. They actually begged for regulation. So the two by four um, is not exactly um, an example of a custom. And the same thing which, um, with the baker's dozen, which actually has its origins, I won't bore you here since it's trivia, in aspects of early English criminal law um, for shortchanging people on the weight um, of bread. But I'm glad to take any questions um, that you might have along with Omri. And thank you, Omri. Great. Any, any question, any discussion, any Anybody wants to pop, jump to the defense of Carl Llewellyn and legal realism? Filippo. I'll ask a question. Do the insights, do they change once you have a, a, a situation like consumer contracts where there's an imbalance of power, do you think? Uh, or, or do you think that it remains the same, that the, the same kind of insights and thinking would apply there as well? So, so do you want to clarify what do you think might change in consumer contracts? I'm thinking that like once you have like a contract that's one to one or two to one or something like this, you have a more relational, uh, like a more clear relation versus sometimes you have like one contract that applies to thousands of people. So you might, you might have some kind of like unfairness if you relax to only one person or another and then and this will be like lead to changes in the law or something like this. Like that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, I th um, it, it's an interesting question and it's an interesting, uh, um, dichotomy because obviously in consumer contracts something very different is going on parties are not dealing at arm's length they don't have similar uh, in, in sophistication or similar stakes and consumers largely don't understand any of the technical terms uh, they are not supposed to and it's good that they don't understand they can't be experts in everything and, and therefore there are the logic of uh, incorporating parties understanding cannot be extended. What we need to do is to have rules that reflect the non-understanding of consumers. Rather than rules that incorporate the understanding and the practices, incorporate the non-understanding and non-practices, the passivity, the autism, so to speak, quote unquote, of course, of the consumers in the market. So we have interpretation against the drafter. Rather than try to figure out what the parties really meant, we were going to something that entirely not meant just so that, you know, to protect consumers or things like reasonable expectations, what consumers can expect in situations uh, like this. And we uh, try to, I can give you an, an example how in situations where, you know, what, what consumers mean, I understand and how firms cater to that. So I wrote in a separate work, I wrote about contracts that are marketed to people under the category of no contract. Come sign with Comcast or with AT&T, no contract. That was in billboards everywhere in promotions, in advertisements. They tell you, yet you have no contract. Now, what do you mean you have no contract? Of course you have a contract with them, but they mean to say no obligation, you know, no lock in. You can exit, free exit. They use a term in the way consumers kind of colloquially, sociologically understand it. And of course, courts will not override it and say, well, you said no contract, then there is no contract. We look to what consumers understand and try to give it that meaning. Lisa, you wanna follow up? Sure. <clears throat> I think that um, a lot of Llewellyn's notions would be even more damaging in the consumer context because firms tend to be treat consumers better than they're required to treat them under the contract. And if these types of concessions and nice things that they do to keep the customer happy, if they were obligated to do that, the cost might be too high across all contracts 
and they would worry that then consumers would have a right of action against them. So very often you see incredibly one-sided consumer contracts so that the consumer has basically no right of action against the large company for anything at all. But in practice, the company does make concessions and work things out over time and doesn't call every single aspect of the contract and use it against the consumer. So I think that in consumer context, um, the Llewellyn-esque notion um, is particularly pernicious. Other comments, questions? Jared. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for, for presenting this. This was really, really interesting. Um, I guess my, my question here is, is about kind of the framing of, of the talk, where we started out by, um, by sort of briefly seeing, but then immediately rejecting 19th century um, kind of uh, English contract law that was brought over here in part, but also largely taken from, from continental influences, you know, heavily influenced by um, the impetus and, 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 influ and sort of uh, importance of subjective intent when, when it comes to contract. Um, and then we went to the kind of perhaps, uh, as you said in this talk, a little bit of overshooting when it comes to uh, Llewellyn's correction, namely kind of the, ch the contract changing over time, um, uh, the, the kind of innovations that he made with modification and waiver and the problems that Professor Bernstein's work uh, identified with that. But I'm wondering whether Professor Bernstein's work, uh, you know, in that same kind of vein has something to say about like sort of middle ground innovations that Llewellyn had with respect to, um, or they pushed for with respect to contract law. So um, objective grounds of uh, assent, objective grounds of interpretation, uh, the duty of good faith and fair dealing. I'm curious to what extent Professor Bernstein's insights as I would say about those kinds of, um, those kinds of uh, features in contract doctrine that aren't as, um, aren't sort of as radical almost uh, as, as modification and waiver. Professor Bernstein. Okay, well, I'll take on um, good faith. Um, one of the interesting things about the commercial systems that I studied that were set up by merchants is they do not have a duty of good faith implied into their contracts. Now, that's not to say, however, that they don't discuss good faith in the opinions that they write, which in many industries are widely circulated. So they will say something like, you know, the buyer wins under green rule 42.3. Um, the rule is clear. However, it is the opinion of the arbitration tribunal that the buyer acted in bad faith. So the reputational aspect of being found to have acted in bad faith is retained. But again, you keep the outcomes in the cases very clear and definite. And so I think that most of the arguments that I make apply with equal, if not perhaps greater force um, to the doctrine of good faith. And it's very strange, part of my research that I never published because I didn't ever finish it, was interviewing transactional lawyers to see if they would put a clause in a contract waiving the duty of good faith performance if they could. And most of them said, absolutely, they would do that in a heartbeat. And in fact, my parents almost got divorced over this because my father, a transactional lawyer, would do a deal. And apparently all night he'd moan, Lucy, Lucy, Lucy's causing a problem. And he meant Lucy, Lady Duff Gordon. My mother thought Lucy, of course, was the mistress. So I learned um, with mother's milk, so to speak, that this particular aspect of the law really does cause transactional lawyers nightmares, quite literally. And that's one of the things that motivated me to go out and try to explore it further. As to objective assent, not my number, I'll leave that to Omri. Um, I'll say something not related to objective assent because I think objective assent is probably predates uh, legal realism, but it's, uh, I'll talk about the it's a work that uh, Professor Bernstein and I did together, which is to challenge the uniform commercial codes and the Llewellyn-esque uh, uh, ideal of remedy. When a contract is breached, what do you do? What do you give the breached against party? And again, to some extent inspired by what Lisa saw in the actual practice of the trade organizations, we saw they're doing something very different than the code. The code has this notion of 
the no make the aggrieved party the breached against party whole put her in as good a position as she would have been in had the contract been performed expectation damages right but it is very vigorous in trying to make sure that every cent that the party expected will be given and there's a, lo a lot of evidence is invited into litigation over these issues of what would have happened under the contract and how well would the grief party been under the contract we need to resurrect that expectation damage what lisa saw is that in many contexts parties don't use in reality in trade in merchant life don't use this remedy because it's very uh, costly to adjudicate and instead they use the very simple reliance damages just your out-of-pocket expenses you will be compensated for them the tort remedy not the contract remedy why one of the reasons that we we hypothesized and we found some reference to is that litigation over expectation damages over what you would have gotten under the contract what your profit would have been that doesn't only require to bring information that is costly to produce but it requires people to reveal secrets what you know how much money i would have made. they don't want to reveal this they have what we called a secrecy interest and that secrecy interest is sometimes more important than making getting damages and so what the code does is by allowing the defendant to require a trial over what was truly the lost profit it undermines the ability of the plaintiff to get any kind of remedy um, and it kind of shoots itself in the foot this way they say this idea this doctrine so that's another legal realist idea that has gone you know has, that has been taken to such extreme that it doesn't uh, work well with it i think we have maybe time for one more question but we don't have to it's one o'clock i promised robin that we will finish by one o'clock so maybe it's good time to uh, to end thank you all for joining us happy to i'm sure lisa too happy to get any kind of follow-up questions and discussions absolutely by email and uh, there will be another one of those some in you know another chicago based idea some other chicago faculty member based idea forum in a week or two and i hope you're healthy safe and studying well despite past mandatory pass fail see you later